I am Troy Clarkson. It is Friday, May 20th, 2022, and this visit is with Valerie Harding. So welcome, Valerie. Today we're going to talk about some of the history of Falmouth Heights. And just before the camera came on, you and I were, uh, well, you were sharing stories about that rich history. So let's, let's actually start with that. There are so many roads within Falmouth Heights uh, that are familiar to people. Uh, but you know the history behind some of those names. So, for instance, uh, when I was first married, my wife and I lived uh, in a rented apartment on Jericho Path, where there are condos now. Before that, they were apartments. Before that, they were tennis courts. So that's oh, yes. Just before what we used to call the wee bump, where that hill went mm -hmm. over. And you mm -hmm. could, if you drove fast enough, you could get your car airborne. Uh, I, so I've heard. Uh, well, <laughs> you'd always ask your parents, to drive, especially your father, to drive really fast. <laughs> right. So tell us, though, in that immediate area, I mean, Falmouth Heights has a history as the first planned uh, summer resort community, but it's so much more than that. Well, long before it was developed as a summer resort in 1880 by a man from Worcester, or actually a consortium of men from Worcester. Before that, in back in the 1700s and uh, the late 1700s, it was considered a very remote part of Falmouth. And uh, Jericho Path, the name always interested me because I grew up on Johnson Road. And you know, why was it called Jericho Path? Well, after doing research, come to find out, the inhabitants of Falmouth from the late 1600s to the 1700s, when they had large dead, dead animals, they couldn't bury them off Main Street. So they would take them up to what they called Jericho, which was the hill on the heights, and they would, cart, I guess, drag them up there and leave them there. So that was, it was called Jericho on the Heights Hill, and it became Jericho Path. And I since have heard from, um, actually someone whose father was an excavator in Falmouth, that sometimes when he would dig foundations, he would find bones of large animals up there. They, the kids thought they were dinosaur bones, but they were probably horse and cow. But the other thing is, in that same vicinity is Lake Lehman Road. When they developed um, Worcester Court and Grand Avenue, uh, they also laid out other roads, Worcester Court, was where I ended up in high school. And that was in 1959, and there were still dirt roads down there. And Worcester Court intersects with Lake Lehman Road. Well, where was Lake Lehman? They decided to change the name of Little Pond to Lake Lehman, and it remained so for probably about 20 years until the local townspeople decided to change the name back to Little Pond, which is where you which is where the tennis courts were. Right, yes, and, uh, and, and so I've got lots of connections in that part of town. We moved here to Falmouth when I was four, uh, but before that, my grandparents had a, had a home. It was a summer home, and then they moved here full-time on Hudson Street. Okay. Right in that area. All right, there uh, was nothing there. It was all woods we kids used to play in there. Lots of skinny little dirt roads. And in fact, Worcester Court, um, where Lake Lehman and Worcester Court intersect. And Worcester Court is now, well, we called it Worcester Court Extension, which goes down behind the plaza. That was all dirt roads right down to the Cranberry Bog, which is the Falmouth Mall. So um, they were just little dirt roads even back in the early 60s. So let's talk about that a little bit then, because I, I uh, it, as we sit here in May of 2022, that former Cranberry Bug Falmouth Mall property just sold to a developer I read in the paper for uh, uh, $59 million. Wow. So tell us, share with us your memories of that tract of land and how it unfolded. Okay, so if you go down T-Ticket Highway, um, right where the bank is across the street from CVS, that was Hazleton's junkyard. And the Hazeltons later moved their junkyard to Gifford Street, which is where the storage units are, just beyond the Little League field and all. But that was a junkyard, and it was downhill, down to the Walmart area, was all junk cars and everything else. As kids, we used to ride our bikes down the dirt road, which was, became Worcester Court, when the bog froze. And 
we used to put our skates on and run across the dirt and jump over the ditch and skate on the bog. Our parents weren't too worried because it was a bog and how far can you fall in a frozen bog. Um, Little Pond we also skated on. That used to freeze over and there were a lot of bonfires and there weren't, many, there weren't any houses down on Miami Ave, one or two. Um, actually, my, my father bought a lot of land down there, but my mother wouldn't build a house down there because it was too deep into the woods. <laughs> Imagine that, too deep into the woods. Yes, right. Uh, in Falmouth Heights. It, yeah. The, now a, a, a beautiful year-round residential area. So and you, imagine being on the water on Miami Ave, you know, right on Little Pond there. Right. Near the beaches and, yeah. So, um, and uh, from Jericho Path down to Falmouth Heights Beach, in the winters, it was, it was like a ghost town. There was no light, no lights on in houses or anything like that. There were no lights on. Um, all the homes were dark they, because they were all summer homes. They were not insulated. They were pretty much just large cottages. Uh, in the winter, we used to go down and sled on Heights Hill. But uh, when we would sled on Heights Hill, we would sled down Grand Avenue because no cars traveled there. And um, sometimes they plowed it, sometimes they didn't. And then we would sled across the street right through the casino <laughs> and out onto the beach. Now, uh, I've had the, the chance to do several of these interviews over, over the last couple of years. And, uh, and then through the work that I do with my column, uh, talk a lot about the history of that area. So my uncle Henry, who was a pediatrician in Brockton, had a summer home right there. In fact, uh, on the corner, on the ball field, that was, mm -hmm. that was his home. Mm -hmm. um, he then ironically sold it to the Stone family. And of course, decades later, Phil Stone became my stepdad. Right, so, okay. Uh, yes, I remember but, Dickie Stone and his brother living there. But the predecessor to the Cape Cod Baseball League used to play games at that Heights Field. Do you have any recollections of that? No, uh, I grew up in a family of three girls and we really weren't into those ball games or anything. Um, what I really have strong recollections about are the large hotels. They were still the old wooden hotels with the turrets. And you know, on the corner of Worcester Court was the Park Beach Hotel, of course the Terrace Gables. Um, the Tower Hotel was still there. It was really um, the type of resort area that families came to from the city and on the train, and then they would stay for a week or two in those hotels. Well, in the winter when those hotels were closed up, as kids you'd run across the veranda and it looked very ghostly inside with the table still set up, you know, with salt and pepper still on the table. And uh, it was kind of creepy uh, because there, you also got home before dark because there was, as I say, there was not a light on in any house down there. And um, that was from Jericho Path up. And also, we had a little tiny post office for Falmouth Heights that was only open in the summer. And where was that? That was, uh, I, I can't think of the name of the motel, but it is still there. I think it's called the Heights Motel, actually. And it's just before you hit Grand Avenue coming up Heights Road. Right, oh sure, yeah, yeah. And on the other side of it, there was a little donut shop. That's where I had my first job. But that building also, you know, these, these buildings, even these um, big summer homes, they didn't have any sheetrock or anything. They just had the studding and the wooden walls. And you, the wires ran up the wooden walls, <laughs> the electricity. It was pretty unsafe, but they were all built that way. Right. You know, even if you went to visit someone you knew who was living I knew a couple of people who lived right on the right on the height of Heights Hill, right on the facing the ocean with the ocean view, and those cottages were pretty rustic. So um, they were built pretty rustic that way, and of course they um, were from 
in the beginning, they, the, the men who were the business group, they sold mostly to families from Worcester. As in Minot, the man who developed that sold mostly to families from Attleboro. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. Isn't that interesting? Yes. So, um, and in, in Minot, they had a Minot hotel and they sold the property, you know, surrounding the hotel eventually to people who came and stayed in the hotel and then decided to build their summer cottages, which those cottages at the foot of uh, Central Avenue are kind of similar, you know, Victorian looking, but they were roughly, the outside looked nice, but inside it was very rough living. But they liked that back then in the 1880s. You were going to stay in your summer camp. Right, right. And, and it, some of those families, both in the Heights and in the, the, the Monon area, are, are still there. Yes, Have absolutely. been coming for generations. Yes, yeah. And of course, up on the Heights Hill, they had a, the small chapel, and it eventually became an observatory, and right around the circle. Um, that's why there's still Chapel Ave up there. There was a chapel there. And um, that little area there, which is so interesting to me because it's very much like Oak Bluffs, the little cottages. Yes, with the gingerbread houses. That's yes. funny you should say that. Let's talk about that for a second because a lot of people I know come here or live here for years and never get to that area because, mm -hmm. you know, you go to the Heights and the beach and the, the restaurants there. But the area we're talking about is is tucked away it is up high yes but you have to sort of know how to get there to yes. get there even though it's right there right exactly and I think it's it was that style of building because they had Methodist camp meetings that's how Oak Bluff started and that's how the that area started up in the Heights and also a, a, a tiny bit of Monant started the same way that's why they built Grace Chapel over there so, um, you know, the architecture, it's very interesting to look at it because it was popular at the time to build your little summer camp and have everybody come down to a revival, you know, Methodist meeting. And um, I, I just find that so interesting, you know, and uh, I don't know if you remember, but Mr. Craig, who was a teacher when I was in school, he probably retired shortly after I left high school. But his family owned the Craig House, which was a big hotel which was up there. It was later bought by um, two guidance counselors in Falmouth. I'm trying to think, uh, Mr. Wasseth, and um, who you probably remember. Sure, Paul Wasseth, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think he was an employee of Mr. Craig's and eventually he, he and his family bought the Craig Hotel, which is gone now. But I sometimes drive up that little hill there and around Chapel Ave and wonder where they tucked a hotel up there. But by the same token, right not one tiny little block in front of it was the, was the Terrace Gables, that hotel, and then just down the hill was the Tower House, House Hotel, and then you had the Park Beach Hotel. I mean, think about right there on basically Heights Hill and just down at the foot of it were so many hotels. Isn't that amazing? And then we're adjacent to what was the, the Tower House Hotel people today would recognize is that expanse of open space mm -hmm. we call the Kite Field. Yes, and that's an interesting story. That um, uh, when the Tower House Hotel was sold, well, let me back up. The Kite Field used to be tennis courts. Mr. Tower of the Tower House, he built the tennis courts there. And uh, eventually in the late 60s, his family sold the hotel and it, they were selling it to the timeshare people. And the timeshare wanted to uh, put a whole lot of buildings there, you know, little timeshare buildings. And a lot of people objected who lived in the area. They objected, the homeowners objected because their view was going to be displaced. And they won out, I think they took them to court, and so uh, the Tower family left it to the town as open space in perpetuity. And that's how it became the kite field. And, and uh, today I think lots of folks don't even know that it, that's public property. I think you're and, right. And uh, available for public enjoyment mm -hmm. uh, and passive 
recreation. But you know, it's funny as we talk about these things, I, uh, I have vivid memories of my own childhood in that area. And I think instinctively it's 20 years ago, but it, it's 50 <laughs> years ago. And so the ability for us to have these conversations and preserve that history so that future generations mm -hmm. can understand and learn what those landmarks are and, and what they meant and how they developed is really important. I think it is too. Worcester Court with the open space that runs down the length of Worcester Court was drawn out that way by the by those developers from Worcester, um, which to me is so interesting that they had the foresight to you know lay out just that little strip of grass, but it runs all the way down what three or four blocks. Yes, yeah. and um, you know it kind of opens up everything in that area. It it really does, and it and because it's now public property, it always will, and so mm -hmm. it will be some green space in the middle of what's pretty densely yes. residential property. Yes, and actually when the Heights was developed, um, not down by the water, I mean the back, what I call the back end of that area, which was Johnson Road, Holland Road, Hudson Street, Raymond Street, that was after World War II when so many soldiers were coming back to Falmouth and there was no housing. And the soldiers, when they came back to Falmouth, they at first lived in the World War I soldier housing, which was over where the Windfall Market is now, just beyond the Windfall Market. And um, it was pretty decrepit, but that's where they lived. You know, it, it was built for World War I returning veterans. And um, so, of course, there was a building boom to build for all these young soldiers and their families. And along Heights Road, also were the first houses that were built and because that really was not developed yet and um, you know around the Robbins Road area you know on the corner of Jericho Path and if you go up a little bit they were all modest Cape homes that were built along that area and we're just beginning to see some of those homes being turned over into larger homes you know um, and uh, but right after World War II into the early 60s, they were just little Cape homes, which is what they built. I remember my parents bought their house on uh, Johnson Road and paid $750. I'm sorry, 7,500. Imagine that. Yeah. Ten, uh, not even 10, 100 times that today. Oh, it's, a, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And then we moved, we built another house on Worcester Court, but, um, Again, that was all woods beyond there, Raymond Street, Hudson Street, and all of those. So it's so interesting that that area was considered so far out of town, you know, and um, it, Falmouth kind of ended, you know, right there at Heights Corner. Right. You know, it seemed out of town. You, you'd uh, tell someone where you lived and they'd be like, really? <laughs> <laughs> So that, uh, we're nearing the end of our time together, but that, when you, you mentioned the Heights Corner at the beginning and now towards the end, uh, I remember that building on the corner uh, as a Howard Johnson's. It was. When I was a kid. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, and, and then of course it, it, uh, it was Jack and the Beanstalk. Mm -hmm. That uh, was the first Jack and the Beanstalk, I think. Uh, and it's moved around to several spots since and been a bank for many years, but do you remember anything there before Howard Johnson's? I don't, but across the street where the Driftwood Plaza is was nothing but marshland and they filled it in a little bit. That's why that corner always floods. It's a very low marshy area from Morse Pond. It flows over there and there's a culvert underneath. But that was where Mr. Limbaracus had his first clam shack after the war. And he, you didn't eat inside. He just had a couple of picnic tables and he was only open in the summer. And you went to a window and you ordered there. And then of course, Davis Straits was just two farms on either side of the Davis family. And across the street where Staples is now was just a farmhouse and big fields. And a couple of times the circus came to town and put up tents there. Isn't and, that interesting, uh, yeah. wow. It's crazy, really. Be, that, that when I say Falmouth ended there, it did. 
Falmouth Center. Right. Then, of course, we had Tea Ticket, which was a separate village, you know, and they were their own little village with a village market and, uh, you know, post office. They had their post office, their village market, and they, there was a farm. Actually, there was a farm right where Burger King is, a very large farm and farmhouse, and that farm went way down to the Cranberry Bog and the mall, where the mall is today. So it was very rural. Yes, and, and, and agricultural as yes. well. And so mm -hmm. that's wonderful. Well, thank you for painting that wonderful picture for us. I, uh, as I leave here today and drive down there, I'll, I'll have a wonderful landscape in my head. I have one, head. one other tidbit to give you, because I do like the, the little hidden secrets. Fa the Heights Hill was used by Dr. Donaldson back in the late 1700s for a smallpox hospital, as was Nobska, because both places were so far out of town. And he, was, he had studied in England and he had brought back smallpox vaccine and he was vaccinating people and they did not believe in it, the local townspeople, so he vaccinated his own children and took them out there so that he could prove that it was safe. Isn't that fascinating? And Dr. I've never heard that story. Dr. Well. Donaldson lived in the house where Harriet Dugan has her real estate office. That was his farm at the foot of Nye Road. Mm -hmm. But you think the Heights is so such a smart little area now, but it was once considered so offbeat we had a contagious hospital out there. Uh, uh, wow, remote in those days yes. and really part of the heart of the community today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well. Speaking of the, being the heart of the community, I think that's a good way to conclude. Thank you for sharing you for all of me. those wonderful stories and those happy memories that are in your heart and sharing them with us so that future generations can paint those same lovely pictures. Valerie, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me here. It's been a delight. Mm -hmm.